Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome to our panel. Uh, this morning, we're going to discuss the perspectives on life science strategies, uh, private and public financing, partnerships, and M&A in the aftermath of, the, of, of COVID-19. Um, my name is Chris Magos. I'm uh, head of Europe for LifeSci Advisors. And uh, I'd like to start by having each of the panelists introduce themselves, and uh, then we'll get into uh, the discussion. Soren, would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, hello and welcome, everyone. I'm, my name is Soren, uh, and I am a managing partner of uh, Novo Seeds, and we are, we are the early investment team in uh, Novo Holdings, which is a very large uh, life science investor. Uh, it's important to stress that we are not a corporate venture fund for Novo Nordisk, but we basically uh, have a historical ownership in both Novo Nordisk and Novo Symes. Uh, but we are basically a financial uh, return driven uh, holding company. We invest across uh, my team, Seeds, a venture team, and a growth equity team, and a principal investment team, and deploy about between one to two billion dollars uh, annually into life science. Um, the role of my team is basically to build and launch novel biotech companies. And we have about a portfolio of 20 companies, a little more than that, about half of which is clinical stage, built from uh, early stage uh, innovative science. Uh, so that that's short, short on us. Thank you, sir. And Benedict, can you go next? Yes. Hello, everyone, and uh, look forward to this panel. Uh, my name is uh, Benedict Bakke, and I work as a portfolio manager uh, for DNB Asset Management. So I'm part of the healthcare team, and we have two pure healthcare funds: the DNB Healthcare and the DNB Biotechnology. Uh, we do also have two other funds or three other funds uh, which invest in healthcare. That's the Disruptive Fund, the Nordic Fund, and the Nordic Small Cap Fund. So we have quite a bit of healthcare investments uh, in DB. Thank you. Mario? Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mario, Mario Gustumaya, and I'm the head of investments uh, at uh, Novozymes. Uh, AS, for those who don't know, Novozymes is the world's largest industrial biotechnology company uh, headquartered here in Copenhagen. And uh, my focus within uh, Novozymes Investments, which is our kind of quasi version of a corporate venture, if you like, uh, is to look at, uh, at very early stage companies and startups in uh, industrial biotechnology covering human health, food production, animal health, uh, chemical reduction, and uh, water treatment as well. And Ulrika. Hello, my name is uh, Ulrika Svonebjake. I'm the uh, CIO and uh, one of the founders of Arctic Aurora Life Science, and that's a public uh, usage fund. Uh, we have approximately 220 million US dollars uh, under management. We are uh, based in Stockholm, but we manage the but the team. Uh, we have a larger team in Oslo, uh, Arctic Fund Management, and. Um, uh, our fund is, is, as I say, it's focused on public equities. We can also do crossovers and, and the smaller part of private. And uh, we focus a lot on innovation. Our kind of uh, core is to focus and invest in companies that address unmet medical needs. So innovation is, is very important when we invest in companies. Uh, and we do invest both in biotechs and, and larger pharmaceutical companies. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm with LifeSci Advisors. Uh, we're a consultancy that offers a range of services, investor relations, communications, business development support, um, and, and other things. Um, we have around 200 clients and over uh, 200 staff. Um, I would say about 40 of our clients are in Europe, 25 or so in Israel and the rest in, in the US. So we've had a front row seat to uh, 
what's been going on over the past few months. And um, I think uh, the panelists will agree that it's been surprisingly positive in terms of um, how the markets have responded, uh, at least for biotech and a, a couple of other sectors, medtech, of course. Um, and we're seeing um, you know, record amounts of investments in uh, both the public and, and the private space. Uh, we saw that start in the U.S. and, and Europe has uh, characteristically a little bit slower, but has also started to enjoy that, um, those opportunities in, in the markets, uh, both for public and, and private companies. Um, so it, it'd be interesting to hear uh, the panelists discuss what are the impacts uh, on uh, your portfolio companies, but also your you know what is your what are your views on on the current uh, markets over the past few months, and where do you see this going? Feel free. You... Go ahead, Olga. Okay, so when uh, I would say that when the pandemic uh, um, started or when it emerged, uh, I remember the focus initially was on on the manufacturing companies whether they would be able to, to get the API, uh, but, but soon uh, I think we, we saw that that was not the bigger problem, but uh, very early on we identified clinical trials and, and launches as risk factors uh, for, for the companies that we are involved in. And, uh, and then uh, of course, um, hospital administered uh, drugs, those who produce those and market those uh, would, be, would be hurt. And, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to my view, I, I think the, the, uh, what you see now is that, that that's true. Those were the risks that, that, that faced the, the industry. Uh, but also we see that uh, the, the industry was remarkably resilient in, and, and uh, have been to a large extent uh, able to, 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 to uh, adopt and, and uh, as we hear now, uh, clinical trials are moving on and, and uh, actually also launch, launches are being done in, in, a, in a modern way and, and uh, are, are much better now. Um, so uh, we, we, we see that it's a very resilient uh, business. Uh, the, the, the question mark we do have now is, is the regulatory risk uh, and, and what's going on in FDA. And and that's my question so far. <laughs> I uh, might comment on uh, the FDA uh, risk we have seen during the summer that uh, FDA struggles to keep uh, timelines. Uh, everything is virtual and uh, they are largely focused on vaccines. So uh, there has been some surprising uh, complete response letters by FDA. So uh, it's a lot of discussions now how uh, this will impact uh, companies and milestones going forward. Um, there has also been a reorganization in FDA after Scott uh, Gottlieb um, left the comp uh, left FDA. So um, uh, we see that many generalists uh, pull their money out of biotech and are more concerned uh, on the regulatory risk uh, than we saw initially in the pandemic and that's also the reason why the sector has pulled back uh, a bit uh, the last two months. So maybe just staying with Benedict and Ulrika on this, how, how does, has that impacted your observations? I think everybody uh, recognizes that as a serious issue. How has that affected your investment strategies? How have you adapted to this? Yeah, to, to the regulatory risk, you mean? Yeah. yeah it's it's difficult. I think as, a, as an investor in public companies, it's, it's important to understand how uh, FDA is thinking and working. And uh, we, since, uh, as Benedicta mentioned, since Scott uh, Gottlieb, when he was there, he kind of made a lot of improvements. So uh, it was a very good collaboration between the industry, the, the biotechs and the pharmas and, and FDA. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say that it's not a collaboration now, but it feels like it's more unpredictable and we have seen those uh, 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 complete response letters coming in, in, 
in a way un unexpectedly. Uh, uh, but what I what I, I would guess would happen uh, when they get the organization in, in place is that um, they would look into those very, I mean, very urgent drugs where you have a, 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 a medical need that is, is really huge and, and they would kind of uh, take them up into focus again. But surely the, the focus have, have been on, on virus and also um, it's now it's also a discussion whether the management of, of FDA, how they, how they relate to the political situation and so on. But for us, uh, to answer your question, we focus, as I said, very strongly on, on, on products where you do have the, the urgent unmet medical need. And I believe that over time, those drugs needs to come to the market and therefore they should be uh, given a, a fair review. Uh, but for us also, so I, I would say that uh, um, those complete response letters that, that came uh, maybe could also be explained by that the, the urgent need wasn't that uh, acute right now. So, yeah, I think uh, medicines that would kind of really bring something to the market, they, they will be reviewed, but they need to get their place in order. Benedict? Yeah. yeah, I can also comment on that. It seems like the FDA is more cautious on uh, new drug entities where they have ex accelerated approval and they will take a more cautious stance. So I think because so everything is virtual, there is uh, less communication and, uh, and then there um, we see these um, unexpected responses. But I do believe that uh, when we have a more normal situation, this will normalize and uh, we will get to a more situation. But there is a lot of discussion going on um, if they are more conservative on those new uh, drug entities. But that's are the you, are that's you it's, yeah. avoiding exposure to companies with regulatory risk at this point, or would you rather uh, not comment on that? <laughs> No, of course we go through our portfolio and uh, see uh, one extra time, although it's a med medical need, we try to uh, analyze whether is there anything in this uh, regulatory environment which could change or could have changed uh, now um, and walk through those, yeah. So maybe I can comment on, on the early stage uh, or the, the other end of the pipeline. I think um, um, what we have seen is uh, t t two avenues. So one is how are venture back companies getting financed? And we clearly see that that is moving forward very nicely. Um, people meet virtually that you don't have to do you know, online visits for diligence and, and deals get done anyway. I think, of course, uh, these things get done when you do business with people you trust. And if there's a good syndicate in place, it's easier as a new investor to come into a deal where and where you don't have to do an on-site visit, for instance, um, if you trust the people around the table. So, so I think that is definitely getting done. Uh, on on the operational side, we we've seen uh, companies being tremendously creative to keep their uh, clinical trials on track with um, you know home home visits for certain follow ups and uh, shipping drug product around the globe and and really really doing a huge effort to to keep trials on track and not losing data points. Um, and, and we are seeing some delay, but not detrimental delay. And the fact that companies have good syndicates where funds have uh, you know, been filled up recently, I think is a, the, in, the impact of that is, is, is smaller than you could have feared then. But, but certain trials will be, will be delayed but we're not losing data points and closing trials and, uh, and companies running out of, it, of, of money. That, that's sort of a high level view from, from at least our portfolio. Maria? 
Yes, uh, and if I can add to uh, Soren's comments, and I, perhaps my comments will be more on the industrial biotechnology space. So not so much pharma, even though we have uh, minority investments in pharma companies, but I think what we had to focus more during the pandemic were our very early stage companies that had no sales um, uh, or very early sales and were in the process of trying to raise capital when the pandemic broke out. So that posed a risk, uh, particularly for companies in agriculture or bioagriculture uh, or bioenergy and some other sectors that are not necessarily pharma related. Uh, what we noticed was that many of those companies succeeded raising capital uh, and most of those were actually driven by the insiders or existing investors. So uh, the companies that had a good proposition managed to get uh, the investors to back them, which was great because it allows them to uh, move forward uh, and stay on course. Uh, but what will be very interesting to see is basically those companies who did not manage to do that or which will be having to find new investors uh, to, uh, to back them uh, into this sort of second half of the year into 2021 how they will cope with that. So uh, we're not so far, so good. Things have been relatively smooth uh, uh, from our perspective, but we think that, uh, you know, we are still sort of not completely out of the woods and uh, there are so many startups out there in our space, super early stage, uh, which is still kind of figuring out their models uh, that, uh, you know, they do require new investors to come on board. And uh, to Soren's point, it's really about, you know, not only um, be willing to invest in your companies, but it's making sure that you have the right uh, network of co-investors on your side uh, to make sure that uh, that business idea can actually you know, come to fruition. So I think we are, we are up for some very interesting quarters uh, uh, for, the, for the rest of this year and into next year. What, what have you been observing about the pace of financings? I mean, there have been a tremendous number of financings, but do you see them uh, going more slowly taking more time because it's virtual or how, how, how is that? How are you perceiving that? I think, actually, I think it's fairly normal pace uh, from, from our point of view. I think the, the big differentiator is, is if you are going to invest as a new investor into a new company where you don't know the team and you don't know the investor syndicate, that is probably more difficult than than doing a deal with somebody that you know and trust already. So uh, I think, um, I guess everyone wants to, to get out on the road again and, and meet new people and, and meet uh, P, you know, companies face to face. Um, so I think that is where the, the biggest disadvantage is as of today is that if you do business with people you know and companies you followed, it's fairly easy if you have to step into something completely new, it's, it's more difficult, but it's getting done. And, and maybe the perception from the public markets perspective on, on uh, financing, uh, are you seeing, I mean, are you seeing the, the speed at which they're being done as unusual or um, as, ex as business as usual? In you the mean market? more? more IPOs in terms of well, IPOs. Yeah, I mean, financings in general, whether it be uh, IPOs or follow-ons. I think it's a remarkable strength in the market. It's, it's amazing how, how all these deals have been done. And uh, I mean, it's been strong, uh, if you say the last five years, it's, it's been strong, uh, it's been strong for, for biotech IPOs as such. Uh, but this year, it's, 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 uh, it's very strong. I, I think we have had around 50 IPOs so far in the biotech market in the US. That's, that's more than one a week. And, and uh, the performance is strong. They are up uh, on average, I think, more than 50%. And, um, and, and it's amazing. Now we, we have more than 600, I, I think it's 650 publicly traded companies in, in the US biotech sector. Um, and that's a lot if you compare with like 2010, I think it was around 200 or something. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's a strong market and, and uh, uh, we are amazed that, that those deals uh, have been done. But on the other hand, I would also say that, and it's interesting to hear your other uh, views uh, on that, but our sector has been more in favor right now. Uh, and uh, in the spring, it was viewed as one of the or the solution to the problem. So we saw what we have been 
uh, uh, naming the, the biotech tourists, uh, investors from the public markets that don't normally invest in, in biotech that, that came into to, to, to the sector and, and there was a renewed interest in the whole area. Um, I don't know whether they would stay or not now, but, but, but we have had a strong interest also because of the, the, the corona uh, uh, situation, I think. Mm -hmm. Benedict, what's your perception? Yeah, I can uh, agree with uh, Ulrika that there has been a fantastic uh, sentiment. I think it will be very interesting to see um, how it will evolve now in September and then they go uh, nearer to the election. Um, uh, like Ulrika said, we have had uh, many journalists uh, giving more attention to the sector, but we do see now um, that the general uh, journalist sec um, investor uh, interest wane uh, because of the regulatory risk, the rhetoric around the election and uh, more uncertainty in the sector. Um, so um, hopefully we can get some renewed interest uh, by the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because the money is flowing into the sector from uh, multiple sources. I mean, there's certainly the, the generalists are active, but we've also seen a lot of the funds uh, raising money uh, mm -hmm. themselves, VC funds, public equity funds. Um, what's your um, view on that? Is is that also um, sort of tourist money, or is is this uh, an expression of you know a maturing industry and a lot of solid businesses that that need to be invested in? I think there is just more attention to this uh, sector and uh, um, we see uh, general, general investors, uh, uh, professional investors go into the industry that hasn't been there before, like Ulrika said. Um, so, um, yeah. Can I add longer term? I, I think, I mean, uh, even before the pandemic, Looking at what happened with the pipelines, I think it's important. I mean, uh, you, you have a transformational time, I would say, within R&D. And I, it's, I would very welcome your other thoughts around it. But I mean, look what, what, what gene therapy enables in terms of treating diseases. Uh, look at the uh, increased knowledge of the whole uh, inflammation system in the body look at oncology, uh, uh, cell therapy and targeted therapies. There are so much innovation uh, actually yielding new investment opportunities. And, and I think that's a result of the fact that we actually got the, the genome uh, map and we got the tools to explore it further. And I, I would, I would uh, think, and I, I truly believe that we are in a phase where innovation will drive uh, interest in our sector going forward. And, and uh, I think there, I agree with Benedict that there will probably be a hiccup around the election and we see uh, generalists getting a bit uh, cautious again towards biotech. But, but over time, uh, I see uh, uh, so much great investment opportunities from the biotech sector. I, I would agree with that, uh, Ulrika. Also, I, I think from, from that, that, that we see and where we're coming from, there's so much uh, early innovation and discovery. And I think it's all about polishing the diamonds in the right way and do, making the right decisions for a particular technology. And that's of course where we spend a lot of time uh, in, in my team. But if you do that right, uh, you can make a huge difference for patients. And I still believe that the healthcare system will be, will be paying for that. Hmm. I think also that the healthy and positive financing um, uh, environment, environment has uh, given the opportunity for companies to drive innovation forward uh, to a better extent that they have been able to do before and uh, really push things forward. So the whole sector has matured uh, a lot and, uh, and I agree with uh, Ulrika that we will definitely see a lot of... Um, uh, new and uh, good uh, innovation coming forward. Yeah, in terms of uh, financing, if it's uh, going to stick or if it's just temporary, 
uh, our experience has been that no doubt we have a lot of contact and uh, a lot of uh, <coughs> analyst VCs contacting us to discuss the life science space, uh, particularly on our industrial biotechnology space. So uh, that's really uh, uh, very encouraging. I don't think they're there just to try to make a quick buck because you can make a quick buck uh, investing in private markets. Uh, we don't really offer the level of uh, exits and liquidities that you have uh, in public equities. Uh, but I think the fact that they're looking at the space also uh, it speaks for the resilience, which Ulrika mentioned earlier on, uh, but also sophistication of the ecosystem for uh, venture capital and private equity, uh, the way it has evolved the last uh, 5, 10 and 20 years. And uh, we have such uh, uh, sophisticated uh, granting programs across pretty much every life science uh, hub in the world, a very strong academia. Uh, we have the accelerators, incubators and this very large pool of PE and VC funds that are out there. And I think we also started to see this emergence of uh, uh, CVCs and also corporate backed incubators and accelerators. All of those have uh, contributed tremendously to bringing talent and expertise to the ecosystem. And what it does is really it helps the risk, uh, the path from uh, VC to PE to actually becoming a business. And I think uh, generalists are looking at that and that's becoming a little more palatable for them um, with being life science, of course. I have a question from, from the audience, a uh, question from Eric, and, and let me take the opportunity to encourage the audience to submit questions. We'll be very happy to uh, uh, discuss them with you. Um, so it's, it's a question from Eric. I don't have the last name. Uh, VC told me a couple of days ago that he recently saw the emergence of family offices trying to invest in healthcare as they suddenly realized healthcare matters. Is it something the panel feel as well? And how do they see this possible emergence? Um, I'll just say that we, um, we are taking our clients to see uh, family offices and high net worth investors in 10 cities across Europe. Um, it actually slowed down quite a bit as they've been resistant to uh, video conferencing. Um, but uh, we see it coming back quite strongly now. Um, and that they are and, and have been, uh, usually because there is a family member that's been affected, uh, very interested in uh, a variety of different uh, diseases being uh, treated by the biotechnology industry or research. Um, what, are, what are your views on that, Soren and, and Mario first? Yeah, I, I think um, we do see that. Uh, we, we recently co closed a, a deal with a with a family office, um, a, a, and they are getting more sophisticated on uh, on the way they look at this, you know, specialized industry. Um, a, and uh, so I, I echo that and welcome uh, this kind of uh, investment into to our industry. Um, you know that that's a, a network that needs to be built, uh, but it's it's uh, it's something that we're actively working on. Yeah, indeed. Uh, um, uh, just uh, following up on on on, on Sora's comments. Uh, look, what what we see is basically with this healthcare and hygiene flags uh, raised during this pandemic. Uh, they have certainly helped elevate the discussion about uh, healthcare, but more importantly, sustainability and uh, uh, environmental, social, and governance. So uh, that has become a more for relevant uh, opportunity for investors to explore. Uh, we have certainly moved away from the uh, negative screening indicator or box ticking exercise, which ESG used to uh, used to be in the old days. And it has, uh, for many of those family offices and uh, even institutional investors, looking into VC and PE, it has somehow become a, a positive risk-weighted opportunity factor when they're actually assessing long-term prospects and attractiveness of business. So uh, I think we will probably continue to see, uh, to some point, it's, it's going to be a gradual process, I think. Uh, those investors will uh, build their know-how and their knowledge around it, but they do have the time horizon that somehow matches the uh, gestation period of a VC company. So in many ways, uh, it makes sense for them to be exploring those opportunities. I just add a, a, a word of caution that we've we've seen with uh, companies that are um, founded and and developed on on high net worth family office money. Uh, one of the stumbling blocks has been valuation, where they're over, you know higher than what the specialist investors 
uh, are willing to, uh, to pay to come into the capital structure, uh, which can be okay as the families can and additional high net worth investors can support the company for quite some time. We, we've seen one go all the way through phase three, um, but it's very often limiting uh, and leads to um, you know, significant conflict at some point. Uh, when the company has to go to uh, the public markets or, or to venture investors. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would agree with everything uh, that, that's that been said. Ulrika and, and Benedict, how, how about from your perspective, do you see um, activity from the family offices in, in your space? Yes, um, family offices is one of our, you can say, target investors in the fund. Uh, uh, we believe that they fit very uh, well with, with us because of also that they have this interest in, in, in doing, making difference or, or doing impact investments. So we have been uh, having a lot of discussions with our, and we do have investors from that type of group of investors uh, just on the theme that you, know, you can, you can, you can uh, make an impact and you can uh, get returns. So it's, but uh, I, would, I would say there is still uh, some family offices more focused on the philanthropic side, but but our investors are are are, are uh, super happy with, with uh, getting return and, and and doing good as as a positive side effect. Uh, so I think that that's very positive. I I uh, and I also think it's it's super important that we get away from this uh, ESG box ticking uh, models that do not understand the sector at all, uh, and instead look at what this sector actually uh, contributes to. And we uh, very often talk about the, the, the UN goals and the, the number three goal. Uh, we did a sustainability report where we actually tried to pinpoint what is a sustainable biotech. I mean, normally for a biotech company, it's to, to have cash to the next milestone. But, but also we, 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 we had a lot of work done and, and looked at focus of innovation and of course, following all the practices and, and uh, and um, doing a lot of innovation, providing good for society. And, and uh, that's not covered in those box ticking models. So, um, so it's, 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 it's there, but it will grow, I guess. I, I agree. I think Mario mentioned it, that it's in the beginning yet. But, but this is very positive uh, and it, it fits the family office uh, investors very well. We also see uh, interest uh, from uh, family offices uh, and uh, I think many family offices see uh, healthcare as a good um, uh, uh, opposite to the other investments they do and they hold better in downturns, both uh, healthcare in general and uh, biotech. Uh, So it's a good uh, controversy to to the other investments they have. In Norway, we have uh, a lot of uh, high profile investors that also do uh, single investments into uh, single stocks. And I think uh, the initial interest there is that they uh, are exposed to diseases or uh, have a relation to people uh, that are affected. And it starts with that and when they get to know the sector better, they uh, uh, do it more as a professional investment. Um, So I think um, that will evolve even more in the time going forward. The the valuation part though is is, was a very uh, important comment earlier here that sometimes those small companies are before they go into specialist investors hands they do reach valuations that are difficult to reach over when they go uh, public or go into professional VCs because they get into kind of a darling community, uh, which, which is, I think it's, it's, it's not good for the ecosystem to, to get those valuations uh, uh, too early in, in the life of the, those companies. So I've got another question that came in um, from Guy Bishop. Um, the pandemic has accelerated the use of technologies like digital therapeutics. Uh, should biotech 
and pay more attention to digital technologies now? Maybe I can I can take a stab at that. So, so um, uh, from from our perspective, you know, digital therapeutics are interesting. We we have not seen that many of them, but but it's something we we definitely keep keep an eye on. I think where where technology is is definitely making a difference at this stage is is in support of the drug develop discovery and development process. So many exciting companies are coming out. Uh, you know, using AI to to discover and develop new chemical entities, patient selections, uh, finding biomarkers, and those we are very actively looking at and using as to to make more efficient processes in in our portfolio companies. Okay, I think we have about 10 minutes of scheduled time left. We can go a little bit over as well. This is uh, an interesting discussion. I'd like to turn to M&A. And, you know, historically, when valuations are high and access to capital is relatively easy, uh, it's a bit counterintuitive, but uh, M&A starts to happen, even though the valuations are historically high. So um, we've seen a little bit already. What, what are your views on uh, the M&A that's happened and, and uh, your expectations in terms of uh, the next few months and period coming? Mm, should I start off? Um, we uh, were lucky to have one of our uh, portfolio companies taken out uh, uh, in the mid of August. And I think that was one of the first now after the uh, pandemic uh, and of course when you are a biotech investor uh, or a life science investor but for us this was a biotech company uh, you you appreciate the, the big premiums that you get into your portfolio and that's part of the, the the business model for us but it's also i would say part of the whole ecosystem so uh, uh, having said that i i would say that i believe that m a will uh, come back if you say it has been away, but it will continue because it's, it's part of the ecosystem and, and the larger pharma companies and the larger biotech companies uh, do source from, from outside and uh, the smaller companies needs, needs that marketing help. And uh, uh, so either business deals or, or m and uh, I would say that one interesting question is the regulatory risk we see right now, if, the, if that would change uh, uh, to, uh, in a way uh, that the appetite to make, uh, to make uh, M&As in later stages or earlier or, or how, how, what time of the uh, maturity of the biotech company that they would be interesting targets. What you can see now is that, that um, a focus both in terms of IPOs but also I would say the general appetite goes earlier and earlier. So, there are more preclinical platform deals being done than, than uh, I would say it was like three years ago. That's my comment. Benedict? Yeah, um, I can agree with the, um, um, a lot of what uh, Ulrika said that uh, uh, hopefully we will see some picking up at the but uh, with some of the companies with high valuation, I think we might need to see more uh, pullback uh, before we get a lot of additional uh, M&A. But there is clear that uh, many of the large biotechs and uh, pharma need uh, these uh, bolt ons and uh, uh, so we definitely see it coming, but it, uh, it's a question of when and um, also on the timing on the regulatory risk. And they might be more cautious on highly new uh, drug entities where there are accelerated approval and there is more uh, yeah, uncertainty yeah. Uh, around the regulatory risk, at mm -hmm. least. Uh, um, during this pandemic? It's sort of been a rule of thumb in, in the industry not to build a company for, for M&A. You always have to build a business and then if it gets taken out. Um, and, and pharma has, you know, I would say over the last 20 years or so been sort of reducing its 
investment in R&D and infrastructure. Really, many of the farm pharma are more focused on, on marketing and, and acquiring assets. Uh, not all of them, there's always uh, exceptions, but what's, what's, the, um, what's your view on that, Soren? If, when you're starting companies, um, you're thinking about them potentially getting acquired at, at some point. Are you building through to market or where do you see the likely inflection points uh, for M and A. Yes, I think uh, very good questions. I think we are when we are building new companies, we we, we think about them as uh, more standalone entities and uh, with the route to the public markets. Uh, they, they need to have that path, and that's a path that you control more yourself uh, with good data and. Uh, good management and relevant timing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, most, or biotech companies, they're always uh, for sale uh, if there's a good offer. And we, we, uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, interacting with potential uh, acquirers and pharma uh, strategic partners just to keep them updated on the progress, but also to, to get input on the direction and, and feedback. And oftentimes, especially in the early phases, pharma are very helpful in, in you know, getting excited about the technology and um, telling us what they want to see if this, uh, to, to get validation that this concept is, 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 um, is solid. But we want to make sure that that the companies that we build have control their own destiny, and are not subject to to timing and uh, you know uh, other decision uh, processes inside changed. big organization. Yeah, no. over the last few months, I, I expect it. Mario, <laughs> what about you from from your perspective? Yeah, from our from our perspective, we uh, we take a very simplistic approach when we uh, make minority investments, and and it's really try to work and steward the company as much as we can and help them to become successfully, uh, sustainably profitable businesses. So uh, we try not to reverse engineer and try to look for what is the likely end game and try to uh, walk backwards because sometimes they can jeopardize uh, some of the paths and routes that you can take uh, to maximize the value of a particular technology or of particular uh, application that the company might be working on. So. Uh, you know, if M&A happens, it's great. Uh, uh, hope, you know, assuming that it happens at, at a good price, uh, if it lists, it's also an exit point for us. Uh, but we try, you know, for, first and foremost, to uh, add skills beyond some some of the technical know-how that uh, typically the founding team already has, and just trying to make sure that we don't fall in love too much with the technology itself, but uh, uh, but also uh, fall in love with uh, how we apply and how we make that commercial. Okay, maybe uh, just let's turn to the middle ground between M&A and, and financing. There's um, partnering, right? We have a couple minutes left, so let's try to keep our, our thoughts brief. But it, it, it's, it's always funny to me to hear, um, and, and I actually am guilty of writing some of these press releases, but to hear people refer to it as non-dilutive because, you know, investors end up owning less of the asset. So in a way, yeah. It's not dilutive to the shares, but uh, you have less of the upside. So what, what are your views on, on partnerships and, and do you see this changed in the current environment? Is it something that, um, you know, certainly there's some validation. It, it helps with the diligence process, uh, de-risk the investment to a certain extent. How, what are, what are, how are you uh, seeing, uh, if you're, sitting on the board, Soren, of a, of a company, are you uh, pushing them to do partnerships or do you want them to finance and take this product to market? Of course, yeah. I think uh, the, the quick answer is that it depends on, on sort of the, the nature of the company. If you're a platform company and have several programs, the, it, it's very obvious to, to partner one or, one or two of the programs. I think the the regional commercial deals are less of less attractive if you are more or less an asset centric uh, company. Benedict. 
Yeah, I think it it depends on the nature of uh, the deal and the, the company, of course. Um, um, certainly, a partnering uh, will validate uh, or is a kind of validation of uh, the technology and the platform. Uh, we have also recently seen that uh, um, some partners acquired the rest of the company with a great premium. Uh, so it's... Um, I think it depends on case by case. Yeah. Luca, Mario, anything to add? Yeah, no, uh, uh, I'll probably just say that, uh, you know, similar to, to investments or partnerships, really there's no uh, one model that fits all. And, and ultimately, uh, we are working life science and the industry is evolving uh, and every company will have its own priorities. So partnership in many ways can help them to accelerate particular uh, areas of their business where they're not willing to deploy particular capital at that point in time, but someone else can help them to, uh, to accelerate that process. Uh, and if you look at some of the companies who have been incredibly active uh, doing, uh, doing partnerships and different models, you have the Mercs and J&Js and Pfizer's of the world, they don't particularly have one specific model. Uh, they look at everything from you know, new incubation venture models to development models that help them manage capital at risk, uh, or they just do uh, old fashioned you know, uh, investments in, in early stage companies. So I think they all play a role, uh, but they have to be assessed on a case by case really. I absolutely agree. Um, and, uh, and I think that's the good part of it that, that uh, 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 I think there will be different tools to develop those companies and, and uh, everything that can contribute positively to get the ecosystem and, and, and the innovation hubs to grow. And I think that's uh, positive, but uh, depending on the deal and company, yes. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, maybe the, the question was a little bit, you know, it, it's, it's basically um, when you have a large indication where like Alzheimer's disease, uh, a small company probably has no business trying to go to phase through phase three uh, because the amounts of money and the size of trials. But if it's a rare disease, uh, you know, a company like Orphozyme uh, can take those products to the market potentially and, and do a good job marketing them because the trials are small and the numbers of patients are relatively, you know, they're all going to specialist centers. So it, it, it really affects the strategy, I think, uh, on the partnering side and, and the amounts of capital that they need from uh, the markets is, is uh, more limited. Um, well, this has been a super uh, interesting discussion. Thank you all for uh, participating. Um, any final thoughts about uh, what the next, uh, what we're going to see in the next few months? Put your, pull out your crystal ball and let us know maybe just in one or two sentences what you're expecting uh, between now and the end of the year. I think the, the go ahead. Anyway. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I, I think the, the trend will continue. Good data points, uh, yeah, uh, more potentially more IPOs and uh, yeah, that, that, that's my hope and view. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I was going to say the same, but I do also have to have a small, uh, maybe not red, but orange flag that you could see in the public market some volatility ahead of the US election. Uh, but otherwise, I would say, as I said earlier, innovation is drying investment opportunities and, and uh, it's a it's a trend. It's a demographic uh, need, and and uh, we uh, are uh, positive to the long term outlook. I think also in the short uh, or until uh, end of the year, we will see a lot of uh, news on the vaccine data, and I think it's going to be very interesting uh, to see FDA's uh, communication after their meeting on uh, October twenty second, and I think. Uh, what we will see there until uh, Christmas will also affect the markets. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, on the early stage VC space. I do expect the next few quarters will be very, uh, very revealing just in terms of the ability of uh, early stage startups to attract new investors. Uh, and 
In fairness, I probably expect to see some level of pruning uh, and some companies might not make it. Uh, and given that we've been on a 10 years uh, uprise, uh, sometimes that's necessary to, uh, you know, to cut the branches and, and allow the tree to grow and, and make the ecosystem all robust. Uh, but long term, um, uh, I'm incredibly positive or, or using a term that I used to from my public equities days. And I'm super bullish uh, because I think uh, the amount of capital that will be flowing into early stage VC, private equity and life science in general, we only continue to rise uh, because we have some very structurally fundamentally favorable uh, drivers behind the sector. And uh, the more uh, gen uh, generalist interest we have, more institutional money coming our way and also more corporate investing we see. Uh, it, it can only add to the uh, to the uh, to the overall system. Yeah, thanks. That that jives exactly with uh, what we're seeing. Where we have multiple clients who have recently financed and and who are going through financings right now, and they're proceeding very well on the private and and public side. So, um, and thank you so much for your time this morning and participating in this panel and. Um, Thank you also to the audience for uh, your interest. And with that, we'll close. Thank you.